Uh, welcome to the lecture series on uh, real and complex line arrangements. My name is Özgür Kişisel. Okay, then uh, let's start. So uh, I guess uh, we could address most questions at the end of the lectures, but nevertheless, if there's something urgent, you can always type a question. But at the end of the lecture, I'll spare some extra time for questions as well. So uh, the subject of this lecture series is real and complex line arrangements from a certain perspective, because there are many ways in which you can ask questions. And I'll start from sylvester galai type uh, problems and try to move on from there. So uh, the lectures will be uh, slightly advancing in technicality throughout the days. So the first uh, day uh, should be especially elementary and later on there will be new tools. So what I hope to cover today is the following point line arrangements in affine and projective planes, sylvester galai theorem, Melchior inequality and De bruyne ardush theorem. And uh, some good references for today uh, are these two papers which are both very readable one is a survey paper by Borwein and Moser, a survey of Sylvester's problem and generalizations, and the other is uh, a paper by De Bruyne and Erdős, which is titled on a combinatorial problem. So let's start. So let's start with this problem asked by Sylvester already in the 19th century. I think the precise date is 1893. So suppose you have a finite set of points in the real plane, let's say. You start from some finite set of points. Not all collinear. That means they don't lie on just a single line, but of course some some of them might be collinear, but not all. Then what you do is you draw all the connecting lines, which means draw all the lines passing through at least two of them. So you have to draw them all. Okay. Maybe even I missed one here. Okay, all of them should be drawn. And that's the picture. Uh, so draw all connecting lines. And okay, we don't mark the new intersection points. This just stays as it is. Then uh, a connecting line is called ordinary if it contains just two of these points. Maybe I should give even a name to this finite set of points. Let's say P. Connecting line is ordinary if it contains exactly two points of P. And the question which I think could sque squeeze here is, must there always be at least one ordinary line? Do you necessarily have an ordinary line? So this was Sylvester's problem. Now, it turns out that I guess this problem was forgotten for some time, but then resurfaced by Erdős, and then uh, when it was, uh, some very nice solutions came quickly thereafter. But before going towards several different solutions of this problem, let's <coughs> make a small review of the projective plane because we'll use it so often. So this is 
a general discussion of the project. So for this part, you can let k be any field. And take a vector space of dimension 3 over k. So OK. Then uh, the projectivization of this vector space as a set is simply the set of one dimensional subspaces of P. In other words, it's the set of lines through the origin in K cube. So PV is called the projectivization of P, but it carries much more structure than just a point set and you can do geometry on it. So first of all, one can do linear geometry on it. So, so as geometry. So, well, you can proceed in a simple way, for example, well, you can do linear algebra on B, which kind of translates into geometry on PB. Well, what you have to do is think of one dimensional subspaces as points here, just as we said, and two dimensional subspaces as kind of one dimensional collections of points, which are lines. So these are the lines of the projective plane. And obviously, incidences are preserved. So if a one-dimensional subspace is a subspace of a two-dimensional subspace, then the point lies on the line, and so forth. Now, the following picture is rather helpful. Well, for a moment, let's think about the field as if it is the real field and draw a three-dimensional coordinate space. Let's say, OK, label the coordinates in some order, x, y, z. And I just want to put some affine plane uh, somewhere uh, away from the origins so that it doesn't pass through the origin. For example, uh, at z equals 1, that could be one good choice, but definitely it's not the only one. Just place it anywhere so that it doesn't pass through the origin. Okay, then in this case, all these uh, one-dimensional subspaces, which are lines through the origin here, will go through here, and most of them will intersect this affine plane, but not all. Okay, most of them are intersecting, the ones that do not intersect are precisely those which are parallel to this plane. That means those lying inside the xy plane. So most one-dimensional subspaces intersect it, whereas some don't. So the ones uh, one-dimensional subspaces not intersecting z equals 1 are those which lie inside z equals 0. Okay. Okay, these we can think of as sort of points at infinity. So, I mean, we can think of another perspective, we start from the affine plane, we take our points towards infinity, that means it's kind of changing the slope of this yellow line, and once it is, once the point is at infinity, the slope is uh, zero, and you are confined to this uh, z equals zero, and you have a point at infinity. Of course, you can do this from any direction, so there are many points at infinity. 
On the other hand, you can try to do the same thing with uh, lines in that fine plane. So that means you select a line like this one, then that means this is putting together a one-dimensional set of uh, one-dimensional subspaces, so it's a two-dimensional subspace, okay, of the big uh, vector space, and that gives you a line in this affine thing. And there is precisely one two-dimensional subspace of the big space which doesn't intersect this one, and that's c equals zero, that's the line at infinity. So z equals zero itself is the line at infinity from this point of view. Okay, maybe uh, I can summarize what's happening from the viewpoint of the affine plane. So let's forget about the three-dimensional picture and take this affine plane and put it here. Now, uh, to, to each set of parallel lines, you can associate an abstract point at infinity. And if you change the direction, you get another point. And the all set of directions that you can uh, construct gives you a one parameter family of infinity directions. So what's happening up here is you're starting from a line and finding its intersection of this two dimensional subspace with z equals zero, which gives you some point at infinity. And when you change the direction, you trace all the possible directions at z equals zero. Okay, now this particular affine plane is nothing special. Well, you know that uh, any two one-dimensional uh, subspaces of V are kind of, I mean, you can take any of them to any other by a linear transformation. And therefore this projective plane must have lots of linear symmetries. Well, first of all, the vector space V has lots of symmetries, right? So the symmetries of V are given by the general linear group. This is the set of invertible linear transformations from V to V. So uh, if you choose a basis, you can identify this group with uh, invertible three by three matrices. Uh, but then this group also acts on the projective plane because this has a well-defined action. on the projective plane uh, because simply uh, uh, if you have a one-dimensional subspace then if you, multi uh, if you act on that by a linear operator well it doesn't depend on which representative of that one-dimensional subspace you use you go to the same subspace at the end uh, the only thing is there's a redundancy I mean a matrix or a constant multiple of that matrix do the same job on the projective plane therefore uh, you have projective general linear group, which is the quotient group of uh, general linear group by uh, the multiples of identity, so lambda times identity, and k. Uh, this, uh, this quotient group also acts on PV, so these are pro this is a projective general group 
axon PV uh, and the action is transitive. Okay, about this transitivity, we can say more. Okay, any one dimensional subspace certainly can be taken to any other, but there is more. Uh, in V, uh, any basis can be taken to any other basis. So uh, you can say that this group acts transitively on all triples of points, which are not collinear, for example. And even more, uh, because of this quotient thing by extra lambda, uh, there's a little bit more that you can say. If you have any collection of four points, no three of which are linear, you can take that four tuple to any other such point. Let me not write that, but uh, just to keep in mind is uh, this action uh, of PGLV on PV is highly transitive. Okay, now let's go back to Sylvester's problem. First of all, let me state it a little bit more precisely because we'll need variations of this in the future. <clears throat> so what I'll say is a point line arrangement of type A in RP2. Okay, I changed notation here a little bit. This is just projectivization of R cube. Is, first of all, uh, a finite set P of points in RP2. and instead of all connecting lines. So the set of all lines which pass through at least two points of P. Uh, the reason that I'm saying type A is because we'll have another type and we'll go back and forth between the other two to uh, make the reference quick and easy. I labeled it by type A. And Sylvester's problem once again for a type A arrangement in which not all points are collinear. Is there always an ordinary line? Okay, now let's turn to solutions of this question. So Erdős uh, resurfaced this question in 1943 and shortly thereafter there were several solutions proposed. So let's start with Galai's solution. Uh, the answer is yes, there's always 
at least one ordinary one. So the answer is yes. So how to prove this? So uh, more or less all the uh, first group of proofs that I'll present uh, are contradiction proofs. So suppose not. So suppose there is no ordinary line. Okay, so pick any point of your point set. Then, okay, now we can make use of the projective transformation. Send P to infinity in some way. By a projective linear transformation. It could be any point at infinity. It doesn't matter for the purpose. So it's some point at infinity here. And the lines passing through P in your affine plane will look like some parallel lines. OK. Then, well. There must exist some line which doesn't pass through P. Among all such lines, choose one for which this angle between that line and the set of parallel lines is minimal. So choose M and L, not through P. such that the angle, say theta, between M and the lines through P is minimal. Well, since we have a finite set of lines, uh, we can always do this, right? So there's a finite set of angles, so choose the minimum one. OK. Now, the claim is that this m must be ordinary. And that will give us the contradiction, because the supposition was that there's no ordinary line. So how to prove this claim? Suppose not. And if it's not ordinary, it must contain at least three points of P. On M. So the picture is like this. Okay. We have M. So P1, P2, P3. Well, P is out there at infinity, but you have to draw all the connecting lines. So these parallel lines through P1, P2, and P3, which pass through P, of course. Uh, this must be in your set. This, these must be uh, uh, in the set L. OK, then let's look at this line P, P2. That shouldn't be ordinary either. There are no ordinary lines by assumption. So there must exist some Q in P on, let's say, PP2. 
but let's try to place this Q. Well, if I place it here somewhere, then this line P3Q must be in your set also, but this is impossible because that makes a smaller angle with this parallel set of lines than uh, M, but theta was minimal. Well, the other alternative is it could be on the other side, but then we can draw this connecting line again, which makes a smaller angle. So in all cases, uh, you contradict the minimality of theta. So this was his proof. Okay, uh, let's pass to a second proof. This one is by Kelly. Okay, this is again some minimality argument, but it's a different one. It's not by angle. So uh, look at, okay, you have a set P and L, P set of points, L set of lines. These are both finite sets. So P cross L is a finite set. Now, the Cartesian product. Now look at the following subset of P cross L, which is also obviously finite the set of all point line pairs such that P is not on L. Of course, this is a finite set. And uh, non-empty. Subset. Non-empty because... Uh, there's a pair of point and line such that line doesn't pass through P. Otherwise, all points uh, would be collinear. Okay. Now, if there's a finite set in, uh, in the real plane, you can uh, choose uh, an ordered pair PL and S such that the Euclidean distance from P to L is minimal. Since it's a finite set, we can do this. Okay, let's draw this picture. So you have your P, L, and this distance B is minimum among all possible such pairs. Now, L is not an ordinary line, so it should contain at least three points. Well, look at the foot of this altitude. There are two sides of it, so at least two of these three points must be on the same side of this altitude. Maybe like this. Okay, uh, one option is that one of the points might coincide with this uh, foot of the altitude, which doesn't change the proof. So the proof will still be valid in that case. Okay, so say we have this. Now all these connecting lines must be inside my uh, set of con connecting lines. Okay, so that line is here. But then this distance from Q2 to PQ1, the distance from Q2 to PQ1 is less than distance PL, which is immediately a contradiction. So that is another proof of this result. Okay. Uh, this is another type of minimality argument. Yet another proof, which will have 
some kind of other importance is the one given by Steinberg. Okay, so same kind of argument. So suppose you have some P and L, uh, not all points of uh, P are collinear. And again, suppose there are no ordinary lines, we'll try to seek a contradiction. Okay, now start from some point inside this point at P and select some auxiliary line, which is not in L, okay? Select an auxiliary line. So it's not a connecting line, it's just a simple line through P. So the picture is like this. You have P, you have this auxiliary line, now, we use this L as some kind of marker. So, well, this is the projected plane. So, any line, uh, any two lines intersect. So, that's the corresponding statement to any two dimensional subspaces of R cube uh, have to intersect in at least in a one dimensional subspace. So, therefore, any two lines in RP2 must intersect. Now, mark all these intersection points of L with the lines in capital L. So okay, well, first of all, there is this point P, but besides P, there must be other points. So let's say these are x1, x2, x3. Well, this is going to be circular since once you reach the point at infinity, you'll come back from the other side. So up to some xk, let's say. But let me remind you that uh, these points x1, x2, x3 are not from our set P. They are just the intersection of the lines in L with this auxiliary line. That's all. So these xi's are not in the point set. Okay, fine. Now, this x1 is an intersection point, so it must come from intersection of a line in L with this auxiliary line. And the claim is that this line, uh, S, which intersects, um, well, this, this, is a, this gives you the closest intersection with P in one direction. This must be ordinary. This is ordinary. The S chosen such that uh, it intersects P in, uh, such that there's no other point in between. That must be ordinary. So how to prove that? So let's draw this picture, that portion of this picture again. So you have P, you have X1 here, and you have S here. Okay, if S is not ordinary, then it must have three points on it, at least three. Let's say Q1, Q2. Q3, something like that. Okay, now these may be in quite different positions. So Q1, X1, Q2, Q3 might be in quite different positions. For example, these three points might be all on the same side or two on one side, one on the other or so forth. 
But uh, since these are four ordered points on some circular thing, so two of them will be separating the other two. So they'll kind of be interlaced uh, like this. In this case, Q1 and Q2 separate X1 and Q3 on the circle. So this Q3 is kind of special in respect to its uh, placement with X1. So draw this connecting line. Q3P. Okay, this line Q3P is not ordinary by assumption. There is no ordinary lines, so there must be a third point on it. Okay, now let's try to place this third point. Let's say R. If I place it here, then apparent from the figure is that this line R. Q2 will intersect this auxiliary line in a closer point, which is a contradiction because X1, the, this interval PX1 didn't have any other such intersection points. If R is rather here in the segment somewhere, then you can use Q1 instead. So in this case, RQ1 will intersect it in this forbidden region. That's again a contradiction. And this part above is similar to the part below. So if R is here, maybe it's a little bit harder to see, but still RQ2 intersects in the forbidden region. So in all cases, uh, you obtain a contradiction and that's Steinberg's proof. I mean, these uh, three proofs are all slightly different uh, and it's, it's good to know all of them. For example, Steinberg's proof can be somehow uh, upgraded to obtain other results, as we'll talk about. Uh, and one other comment, maybe before taking a break, uh, it might be a good time uh, to take a break in a couple of minutes, is that all of these proofs somehow use some sort of minimality and in some sense they use the uh, fact that the real number field is an ordered field. So all these proofs use the fact that R is an ordered field. And in fact, uh, you might ask the same question over any field, and the answer uh, is not necessarily yes in that case. So uh, we'll see that, for example, if you ask the analogous question over complex numbers, for instance, the answer is no, not necessarily. You may have no ordinary lines. answer to Sylvester's problem is no. So, I mean, if you kind of come up with a proof which is independent of the field, that must be wrong because uh, on some fields it doesn't work, on some fields it, it does. And likewise on finite fields it doesn't work, for example. Again, the answer is no, in general. Okay, so it might be a good time uh, to, for a break. Uh, okay, uh, let's go on with the second part of today's lecture. <clears throat> now, I mean, now that we uh, saw several answers to Sylvester's problem, that uh, there must be at least one ordinary line, uh, for these type A uh, point line arrangements. Uh, let's try to push uh, this question a little bit further. For example, uh, say, what's the next question that one, one could ask? So, so say PL is a point line configuration
point line arrangements. I should use the word arrangement of type A. Oh, uh, not all points of P collinear. Okay, now furthermore say the number of points is n. Okay, number of points uh, in this point set is n. Uh, okay, we know that there's at least one ordinary line, but what can you say about the minimum number of uh, ordinary lines in terms of n? So what can we say? About the minimum possible number number, let's say mn of ordinary lines. So minimum over all possible arrangements, of course. Well, uh, just for a comment, the maximum possible is an easy question. This is when no three points of P are collinear, then therefore any connecting line is an ordinary line. Then you should just count the number of pairs of points, uh, number of choosing the pairs of points, which is, and choose two. So roughly like n squared over 2. That's the maximum possible number, but that's, uh, in this sense, this is not a very interesting question, but the minimum possible number is fairly interesting. So far, we just know that this mn is at least 1. Okay. Now, before we can uh, discuss this question in depth, uh, let's try to talk about some other tools. So uh, the th two things that we'll need today are uh, projective duality, and also the second thing is Euler characteristic. So let's start from projective duality. Okay, so uh, this is one bonus kind of which comes with projective geometry. So let again V be a finite dimensional vector space over some field K. In the previous lecture, we took V to be three dimensional, but uh, as you might guess, we can take it to be any dimension and the, still the projective space construction works. Well, in linear algebra, we have the notion of dual vector space, right? So dual vector space is, well, there are various notations for it. I'll use the upper star. This is another way to write this. Home VK is the set of linear functionals on B. fairly familiar object from linear algebra. Now, if W is a subspace of V, then, then there is a notion of annihilator of W, which is a subspace of V dual. So, I'll denote this by W perp. This is the set of F in V dual thought of as a functional such that when you restrict to W, it is zero. Is the annihilator of W.
Well, uh, so far, I mean, there's no chosen uh, inner product on B or anything like that, but choosing an inner product amounts to identifying B, choosing a way to identify B and B dual. And if you do that, then this W perp will be just orthogonal complement with respect to that inner product. But unless we really uh, have to do it, there's no reason to do it, so we just take the annihilator in this sense. Now this correspondence W to W perp is dimension reversing That means dimension of W perp is equal to dimension of B minus dimension of W. Furthermore, and some other things that one might want to know, if you do this operation twice, you go back to where you began. Well, here I uh, sort of skipped over something that there is a natural identification in the finite dimensional case of the double dual of V with itself. Well, furthermore, there's one more thing to say. If you have two subspaces nested then these annihilators have the reverse inclusion okay so this is pure linear algebra now what does this have to do with uh, the current problem Let's try to come back to that. So now let's specialize. So now let V be some three-dimensional vector space over K and PV the projective plane as we discussed. Now, the dual V star will also be three-dimensional, and it will have its own projectivization, which is, again, a projective plane. So, we have the following picture. We have PV here, and projectivization of the dual space. They are both uh, projective planes. Now, if, let's say, W, let's say, or U, in B is, let's say, one-dimensional, then in the projective plane, it represents a point. So PU is a point. Now, let's go over here. The annihilator of U here will be two-dimensional. And the projectivization of that is a line in this projective plane. So points in this projective plane are mapped to lines. I mean, mapped to meaning in the sense that there's a correspondence between uh, the set of points and the set of lines here. And you can go back because you can take another annihilator. Okay, uh, if W is two-dimensional subspace, then in this case, PW will be some line, line in this projective plane. And if you go over to annihilators, W perp this time, since this is two-dimensional, this must have the complementary dimension, it's one dimensional, and its projectivization is a point. 
So there is a way to go back and forth between do, these two projective uh, planes in a way that points are taken to lines and lines are taken to points. This is projective duality. Furthermore, if a point here is contained in some line, and this is two ways, then this L perp, which is the point here, will be contained in P perp. So the incidences are preserved, but with a reversal. Okay, now this is fine. This is rather general. Uh, by the way, this is not really specific to a three-dimensional vector space. You can increase the dimension of V. Then uh, the relevant geometric objects uh, will just reverse dimensions, but the incidences also will be reversed. Okay, now let's come back to uh, these point line arrangements. Now, something important for what follows, uh, the dual of a type A point line arrangement, if you dualize all the objects, is not type A anymore. So, I mean, the definition of this type A arrangement was not symmetric uh, in its relevance to points and lines. So then you need another definition. So that's what I'll call type B. So a point line arrangement. Now in RP2 of type B. Is, well, I'll just write the dual of the definition. So a finite set of lines, L, now in type A we had to draw all the connecting lines and here, as you might guess, we have to mark all the intersection points. So all the intersection points of these lines. So that's a type B arrangement. Let's draw a simple example just to visualize. Well, you don't have to really think deeply about the duals because incidences will tell you what kind of object you expect if you want to dualize something. But in principle, you can do everything quite concretely. So here is the example. Let's simply select so for rather general points, but maybe to be able to see the intersections, I'll just place them a little bit closer like that, maybe even like that. Okay, let's draw all the connecting lines. So we have four points and six lines. So if we give names to the points, let's say P1, P2, P3, and P4, and also the lines, some names, I don't know, maybe L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, and L6. 
Now let's try to draw the dual picture. By the way, this is type A. First you put points, then draw all the connecting lines. And here is the dual, which will be type B. Well, for each uh, point, uh, I have to place a line. So, so then we need four lines. And since the points were, were quite generally chosen, I mean, they didn't have any special property, you might guess that the lines will not be special either. So, so these are the four lines. And uh, now, this time I have to mark all the intersection points. And what are the labels of these intersection points? Well, you can check by looking at uh, the incidences. For example, P1 and P2 lie on L1. Therefore, this intersection point must be L1 dual. Let's find uh, the others. P1 and P3 lie on L4. So this should be L4 perp. One and four. Uh, P1 and P4, that's L3 dual. What else? There's 2 and 4 right here. P2 and P4, that's L5. So this is L5. Perp. There's 3 and 4 here. Uh, this is L2, so this is L2 perp. And finally, there is 2 and 3, which lie on L6. So this is L6, which should be the correct labeling. Then uh, you can read many dual statements like here, L1 perp, L5 perp, L6 perp are all on the same line, which is kind of uh, corresponding to the fact that here L1, L5 and L6 are collinear, uh, sorry, concurrent, and they pass through point P2, which is the dual of this thing. So this is now type B. There is a clear distinction between the two types. Here, uh, it's uh, some intersection points are not marked. All regions that you can see are triangles here. Here, all intersection points are marked, but you don't have to have triangles. You might have other uh, quadrilaterals or other polygons in this picture. Okay, so this is all I want to say about duality. Let's speak a little bit about Euler characteristic. Now, uh, let's confine ourselves to the two-dimensional sphere. So, let's take it to sphere. This is the usual sphere. Then, uh, well, we can make any polyhedral subdivision of this. So, that means subdivide into certain polygonal regions. make a polyhedral subdivision.
then uh, I'm sure that uh, 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 this is quite usual thing. So uh, you can count the number of vertices, number of edges, and number of faces in the subdivision. So uh, this V, let's say, number of vertices, V, number of edges, and F is number of faces. Then the upshot is the number B minus V plus F is always two independent of the subdivision chosen. So since this is not a property of the subdivision, but rather the geometric object, this is some number attached to the two sphere. This, the two sphere is usually denoted by S2. Uh, this is the Euler characteristic of of S2. That's equal to two. Well, you could do this for other other geometric objects for other, other surfaces. Now, let's do it for our P2. Now, RP2 has some relation to the sphere. Well, we placed some uh, fine plane here to capture most of the lines, but we could have placed a sphere in our cube to capture all of the one-dimensional subspaces. So then any one-dimensional subspace then would intersect The sphere in two antipodal points. So this tells you that there is a two to one covering map from the two sphere to RP2. Right, so every point has precisely two pre-images, which is a pair of antipodal points. So once you move the subspace, this pair of antipodal points moves. Now, suppose we have some kind of polyhedral subdivision of RP2. Now suppose we have polyhedral subdivision of RP2 with, you know, V vertices, V edges, and F faces. And what you can do is uh, take a pre-image of all these vertices, edges, and faces on S2. And that will create you some polyhedral subdivision of S2 itself. So but then everything will be multiplied by 2. So this gives a polyhedral subdivision S2 with this numbers 2V, 2E, and 2F. So everything will have two pre images. But then we know the Euler characteristic of S2. So this 2V minus 2E plus 2F must be 2, which implies V minus E plus F on RP2 must be one. So B 
the Euler characteristic of RP2 is equal to 1. Okay, so this is a general fact. So far, we didn't use much about line arrangements or anything about Sylvester's problem. Now let's come back to that. Okay. Okay. So the title is Melchior's inequality. Uh, well, uh, Melchior found an inequality actually in 1940, a few years before Erdős's problem was solved by Galai, uh, which answers Sylvester's uh, question, but it turns out that Melchior was not uh, aware of this problem uh, when he did this work. Okay, now start from a type A arrangement with not all points collinear. We can dualize this picture by duality. We obtain a type B arrangement where not all lines are concurrent. Now, if we have a type B arrangement, that means not all, okay, and not all lines are concurrent, well, we have a picture somewhat like this, but we mark all the intersection points, remember? So everything is marked. This gives you a polyhedral subdivision of RP2. And there's an interpretation of uh, the ordinary lines in type A. So uh, if you have an ordinary line in this type A arrangement, then if you dualize, that will be a point where only two lines pass through, right? So then that would be an ordinary point in the type B arrangement. These correspond to ordinary points in type E. These are the ones through which only two lines pass through. And in general, it's a good idea to keep track of how many lines pass through a point in the type B arrangement? So let TK denote 
number of points in type B arrangement through which exactly K lines pass. Exactly K lines pass. So the Sylvester Galai says this T2 is at least one. There's at least one ordinary line in type A, or there's at least one ordinary point in type B. Uh, okay. Also, one more definition is necessary. Let's keep track of all these polygons formed in the type B arrangement. So let MS is equal to number of S gons formed by the type B subdivision. Just an example to make things clear. So let me try to draw. Now, one has to be slightly careful because everything is projective, so you have to count uh, the regions and so forth accordingly. So let's do something like this. Now, this is type B. So I have to mark all the intersection points. Okay. Now, for example, what's T2 in this picture? I just count the red points through which exactly two lines pass. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. T3, there's only one point through which three lines pass. So it's this one. So T3 is one. How about the polygons? Now let's count the triangles. Is a little bit tricky, so let's label them as well. Here is one triangle. This is a quadrilateral, I don't count it. Here's a second one, third, fourth. Now there are some more. Here is one. Well, this is less obvious, but it is because of this projectivity. Uh, well, if I continue out from there, on this line, I come back from here, and on this line, I come back from here. Therefore, in this region, I have to come back from here. So this is the same region. And it has three vertices, one, two, three, so it's a triangle. Uh, let's see. Then I think there's one here because this line is a continuation of this one. That line is a continuation of that one. So this is region six. And I believe this should be also N3 is six in this picture. Now let's count quadrilaterals, so four sides ones with four sides. Here is one. I, I'll label them with letters. E's. So one, two, three, four. Let this be A. Now this is a quadrilateral. Why? So this line 
comes back here, that one comes back here. So this is the same region. And uh, it has four corners. This is one, two, three, and four. Likewise, this is another. And it comes back here. This is the same line as that one. And this is the same line as that one. Again, it has one, two, three, four corners. This is a quadrilateral. And likewise for this one. This is one, two, three, four. So this is the same region. So M4 is equal to four in this picture. And all the others are zero. So uh, PK is zero for K at least four. And MS is zero for S at least five in this example. Well, just even looking at this picture, we might guess there, there is some restriction. These numbers cannot be completely arbitrary. Now, uh, well, a good reason is that the Euler characteristic is, should be one, right? So we didn't really carefully count the edges in this picture. Uh, we could have, but let's not do it. Let's do the general count. Here's a lemma. A, uh, the number of edges is equal to the sum k times tk. So this is times. In part B, two times e is equal to sum of s times ms. Now, how to prove these? Oh, maybe before the lemma, let's go back maybe to the example and double check what this says. Well, but to be able to do this, I think I have to count the edges in some way. So let's see, there's one, two, three four, but it's the same as edge as this one. So four so far, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So there are, there's a total of 17 edges. Now, if you add k times t k's, this is two times seven plus three times one, which is a correct equality, 14 plus three, or s times m s, this is, uh, well, two e should be s times, sum of s times m s, so three times six, plus four times four, this also sounds correct. This is 18 plus 16, that makes 34. Okay, now let's prove it in general. Okay, both of these you could prove by some counting pairs. Now in the first one, count the vertex edge pairs. vertex edge such that V is incident to E. Well, if you have K lines meeting here, well, you can say that 
there will be 2k edges or something like that. So you expect to get 2k times tk from such things, but each edge is counted twice because there's another end to that edge, so you have to divide by 2. So if you add these all up, you get the number of edges. That's the proof of part A. I think I could squeeze the proof of part B right here. This time count uh, pairs EF, edge and face, where edges incident to face. This time, take an S cone Well, this will contribute their S edges, because that, then this will contribute S to the count. So from all such S cones, you ex expect S times MS. But again, each edge is counted twice because it has two different sides. So twice the number of edges should be some S times MS. Okay, that takes care of the lemma. Now, I think we are ready to uh, state and prove the results of Melchior. Okay, it says T2 is equal to the following. T2 is equal to this sum, uh, 3 plus sum of k minus 3 times tk for k at least 4, plus sum of s minus 3ms for s at least 4. So how to prove this? This is almost a direct consequence of all uh, what we did so far, but there's a bit of playing with equations first of all uh, by what we said v minus e plus f should be the Euler characteristic of our p2 so it's one so multiply everything by three three v minus three plus three f must be three now just rewrite this obviously in the following way 3v minus e plus 3f minus 2e is 3. Now, okay, we'll, instead of v, we'll just write 3 times sum of all the tk's. Sum of the tk's is obviously v because every vertex must belong to one of these subsets. Then for e, we use the lemma, part a. We write k times tk. For 3f, well, f is the sum of all ms's. So 3 times sum ms. For 2e on this side, use part b of the lemma. So this equality must be true.
Now, if we look at this a little bit more closely, when k is equal to 2, you get 3t2 minus 2t2, which is t2. I just keep this on the left-hand side and push everything else on the right-hand side. Uh, for k equals 3, you get nothing. It's 3t3 minus 3t3. Th th those cancel. All the other terms, 3 minus ktk, have a negative coefficient. Push them on the right-hand side, and you'll precisely get this k minus 3tk term. Uh, where is the 3? Three? Three, uh, 3 comes from the Euler characteristic. This is 3. So we have this much. Now for the MS part, again, uh, the triangles don't contribute to this count. So if you have uh, a triangle that's M3, 3m3 minus 3m3, those cancel. And everything else has a negative coefficient here. So if you put it on the right-hand side, it will have a positive coefficient. So you have this term, and that proves the theorem. And an immediate corollary is that t2 should at least be 3, because all the terms on the right side are non-negative, so which says there are at least three ordinary lines. So this is an upgrade of uh, the sylvester galai theorem, which told us that there's at least one ordinary line. Now we know that there's uh, at least three of them. And of course, three is a possible number because just a simple triangle shows that you have three ordinary lines. So this is, in the sense, if you uh, one in this generality, this is the best one can say. But still, of course, there's much, much more to say. Still, interesting. Uh, question is dependence on the number of points n. I mean, Okay, we, we can have three ordinary lines, but can you have three ordinary lines if you have 100 points? Well, it will not be the case, and the number will have to increase, so that will be the topic of next lecture. Okay. So, as a last thing for today, which is a related problem, but rather different. Let's talk about De Bruyne Erdős theorem. Which will not play a big role in what follows, but since we came this far, it's a nice place to mention it. So the result is uh, from 1948, and this, it's slightly more general, actually. Uh, but uh, in particular, this is one thing they prove. So say we have, again, a type A arrangement with endpoints. such that, uh, again, not all of them are collinear, not all points are collinear.
then uh, of course one can we we were so far interested in the number of ordinary lines but uh, of course we can look at the number of all connected line or connecting lines so the number of connecting lines statement number of connecting lines is at least n now the statement is uh, this number is sharp for every n uh, we can show as follows Here's a type A arrangement. Not all points collinear. There's one outside. So there are n minus one points down here and n minus one connected lines for them and one extra line for these n minus one points. So uh, this is this bound is sharp. So by the way, such a configuration is called a near pencil. So a pencil would be just a bunch of lines all going through the same point. This is almost like that, but you have one extra line. Okay, let's prove this theorem and then finish. Well, for it's, it's going to be an induction proof. First of all, for okay, the first case where it is interesting is n equals three. I guess for n equals three, it's trivially true because we just have a triangle and it has three lines. So suppose it works up to n minus one. Let's try to show it for n. So uh, now we can use sylvester galai theorem by sylvester galai result. What do we know? There exists an ordinary line. Okay, let's say this L passes through P1, P2, then no other points on L. Then look at P2 up to Pn and the connecting lines through them. Now there are n minus 1 points. So by induction, there are at least n minus 1 connecting lines for this subset. There exist at least n minus 1. connecting lines for these. But L is not one of them because L doesn't contain any of these other points P3 up to Pn. And so you have plus one for L. So you have a totality of at least N connecting lines. So that finishes the induction. Okay, so this is a quick proof based on uh, Sylvester Galai, uh, and with slightly more effort, and it's not much harder, you can show that uh, the bound is sharp only for near pencils. So uh, if you have equality, then you must have a near pencil. That's something you can prove. Okay, I suppose uh, this is the end of the lecture today.